Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to week nine of the Survive Your PhD MOOC. And this week we're talking about my favourite topic on the MOOC, which was boredom. And I'm really pleased to see so many people um, posting such interesting things about boredom on the forum. So thanks for joining us tonight. So tonight, there's me, there is no Katie. Katie is away on leave, but we still have the team here in the office. So we have um, Steph. Hey, hey. We have Crystal <laughs> trying to, to hide there, and we have Jonathan in the corner. They're all tweeting on the Survive PhD 15 hashtag, so you can follow what they say and, um, and click into some of the links that we'll mention tonight. I'll be broadcasting, but also I'll be inviting Steph up to take the Periscope um, camera in a little while. So, without further ado, badges. You love them, we love them. And here they are for this week. So the first uh, Twitter Survive PhD badge is to Kelsey M. Johansson because uh, we enjoyed your soap making adventures. So thank you, Kelsey. Um, we also enjoyed the link that you sent through to us on professors teaching to younger versions of themselves, which we found very interesting. And we'll be tweeting that out shortly. And the second Survive PhD 15 Twitter badge, and I think this we could say, team, that this badge is well overdue. Um, we've been always admiring DebsNet. Thank you for all your contributions on the forum and in Twitter, and congratulations for handing in your thesis. That's pretty amazing. So we're glad that at least one that happened once while we were um, running the MOOC. Um, we'd also like to thank DebsNet for interest, uh, introducing us to the HDR Blog 15 Challenge, and she's blogged about that, and you can read about it um, on her blog, which we'll tweet out in a minute. Now, the first forum badge, and nominated by Jonathan this week, is Duprez V, and for the discussion on the fear of being unproductive. So we thought that was quite an interesting and provoked good responses. And the second one, um, again nominated by Jonathan, goes to Suzanne for her meditation on boredom towards the end of the PhD. Now, those of you who are towards the end of the PhD, <coughs> We have one of those in the room right now. <laughs> Steph is near the end of her PhD. In fact, she's coming to boot camp at the end of next month because right here, at, here yeah. at ANU we support our students in the last March by feeding them and putting them in a room and making them write lots of all, all the words. Um, so we do know that the PhD can get very boring towards the end. So thanks so much for all your discussions on boredom. I enjoyed it and I'm glad that there was the enthusiasm for the topic that I have, which is great. Now, I actually painfully related to some of the posts on the forums. This one from Johanna BD. First off, she says, I found this topic's, week's topic really interesting, especially the TEDx video, because I can relate to so much of what is said. I actively avoid boredom and rarely allow myself to be bored because I always have something going on. I walk with a friend and my dog every morning before everyone else wakes and drop my husband at work and the children at school before coming to uni to work on my data collection for now. I leave to pick up the kids at school, organise afternoon tea, supervise homework and chores and then pick up <coughs> husband from work. One of us organises dinner while the other one organises the kids into Darth and pyjamas. After the dinner and kids are in bed, we often watch TV but I always have some work in front of me or I'm on my phone checking emails and social media. I do this all through the day. I read for pleasure before bed. And besides this, my only other thinking or quiet time is when I'm driving or in the shower. It seems I just won't allow myself to be bored so I can just be with my thoughts and be still. I related to that very much. In fact, it was pretty much the description of my life minus one child. And um, driving and in the shower, pretty much it. Reading trashy novels just before sleeping. That's what happens. Hi, Katie. It's good to see you here on Periscope. She can't keep away. Can <laughs> um, okay, so. Hi, <laughs> and the last bit of Johanna's post. She says, Over the last few months, I've observed myself getting bored while conducting the data collection phase of my PhD. Hmm. I can tick quite a few behaviours from the list, like finding other tasks to do first, getting distracted easily, thoughts drifting while reading, and checking email or social media more often than I actually need to. So, I can be bored. I just don't like that state. And I think, um, you know, it's kind of inconvenient to get bored with work things, but sometimes I find myself getting bored with particularly tedious work tasks. And I actually actually thought about after reading this post, why does that happen? And maybe it's my brain's way of saying, hey, take a break. 
and I won't let it have a break anywhere else in my life. So sometimes it wants to do it at work, which is not very convenient. So maybe, maybe Johanna, you and I both need to take more of a break after work and um, maybe just sort of sit around and let ourselves be bored. Who knows? Anyway, I can relate to not wanting to actually sit in the board state. I find it uncomfortable myself. RMIT Jane gave a, a whole other perspective on this, as she has been doing frequently. So thank you for this. I really enjoyed your post. She says, I really tried to be bored this week. I've put off posting until now to give myself a chance to be bored. I turned off my devices to try to find boredom. Didn't work. Epic fail. I wonder how many of the rest of you tried to be bored this week. I actually tried. Um, didn't work so well. Um, she said she started to think about, RMIT Jane started to think about the people she met doing her research on prisons. And prisoners experience extreme boredom, apparently. Well, they would actually, because they're locked up sometimes for about 23 hours a day. And she says of them, they get bored. Very, very bored. So maybe that's the key. Not getting bored is a luxury and a privilege for those who are free to seek diversity of experience. The prisoners' combat against boredom becomes a major part of their existence. Some of them do this by reading or working or hurting themselves or others. So some of them stop trying and give up their sanity. So that brings me to the question, is boredom a good thing or a bad thing? And that is a great and really thought-provoking question. And that talking about prisoners turning the boredom into violence or into self-harm is, is really quite confronting and terrible. When you think about boredom as a privilege, that's a whole other way of turning it around. Um, so neither, RMAT Jane isn't really sure whether she can answer her own question either, and she continues, I'm confused about boredom. The lovely video that goes with this week suggests that boredom is a wonderful thing to be chased off um, by turning off our devices and letting our brains have a breather. But the other content this week suggests a way to combat boredom and keep it at bay as something to be feared. So which is it? Is it good or bad? Maybe it changes. With degree like my prisoners who have too much, it starts to hurt their minds. Too much of a good thing? Maybe it's tied to idleness. So I've decided a good amount of boredom is a wonderful thing. Um, as it suggests a space for quiet, creative thought and contemplation and perhaps insight. Too much boredom is a very bad thing. It leads to disquiet of the mind. I like that quote. That's an interesting connection between creativity and insanity. And she says she'll think she'll stop now. But I'm loving the learning. And I'm loving the way that we're connecting the modules together because they are all related. They're related in my mind somehow when I thought them up. Um, sometimes the connections are tangential, sometimes they're obvious, but I love it when you're finding them and, and bringing them to light for yourself, so thank you. Uh, speaking of bringing things to light, I'm going to invite the lovely Stephanie to come and present just the next few minutes of yeah. the podcast. Thanks, Steph. <coughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Eve Zinka. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's awesome to be back online here. Um, Inga's asked me to answer a few questions here, which I'll be going through t this evening. There weren't that many specific questions for the live chat this week, but this one from an anonymous student really got straight to the heart of the matter. And I'll quote here. I really like watching an old TV show that I've seen many times before. Is this an indifferent boredom or a procrastination? I tend to do this when I do not know how to solve my research problem of modelling and when I do not understand what I am reading. I watched the video, The Value of Boredom, and I'm glad that I still have that boredom, but how to stop doing this so it does not become procrastination? Now, there were a few awesome replies, one by Agnes UV, who said, I think that when you are avoiding a difficult activity, dealing with your research problems or understanding difficult papers, it's procrastination. As with your behavior, you are looking for something easily rewarding. When I procrastinate, I try to understand at first what it is that I'm avoiding. Then I try to figure out how I will feel if I dealt with the problems that I'm facing. Probably better than procrastination, or at least more proud. Also, I try to have some more free time, because if I'm tired, I tend to procrastinate more. This is very good advice, and, in, and I do agree with it a lot. I also put a post up for this particular thread, which I'll repeat here. I myself think that sometimes, sorry, that something becomes procrastination if it becomes a problem and prevents you from completing a task in a timely way. In my own experience, sometimes I need downtime for my body and my mind to rest 
so that I can best tackle a really complex problem. A bit of time spent doing fun things can really refresh the mind. I think to prevent any activity becoming procrastination, you put a time limit on it. If you're doing it because you don't know how to progress, then the next step would be to take action on how to tackle the problem itself. So for example, you might watch some TV, hang out with some friends, but then return to the problem. If this is still an issue and you're still unable to solve the question, then maybe contact someone who might be able to assist directly. It might be a best friend to soundboard with, a supervisor for some tips or suggestions, that type of thing. The topic of boredom provoked a lot of people to share things they found on the web that related to the topic. Thanks Nadine Chapman on Twitter for this article from The Guardian entitled Want to Learn Faster? Stop Multitasking and Start Daydreaming. We also love this post on existential boredom from Klukas830. And I'll quote again. This module has resonated with me more than any other so far. I'm in the midst of trying to turn things around for myself, having realised that my boredom with my work, a kind of existential boredom, characterised by the feelings of helplessness, like there was no point to my research and that there was no future for me. This had all turned into a pattern of avoidant behaviour, distractibility and jumping in tonnes of projects and activities unrelated to my research. I can't believe how long it took me to realise this was going on. The first fix was to try and make the lab a safe and comfortable space for myself again. Instead of just not coming in, I'd come in and sit in the break room and not do a lot of work. Eventually being in the lab caused me less distress and I moved back to my desk and started doing some more small tasks again. Although I'm still reluctantly on the same project, I found that meeting with my advisor to set deadlines has helped me with the avoidance problem too. I have had to have things done by a certain time, so I can't avoid doing those things forever. Yes, I'm still bored with my project, but it's a little more manageable now, and I really, and I really have to focus on the end goal itself, finish this chapter, so I can do something more interesting. Thanks Klukas830 for that powerful reflection and some concrete strategies for tackling existential boredom. I will admit that I've also experienced this from time to time and tackled it in a slightly similar way to you, so I can tell you hands down that it's very good advice. Thanks everyone for listening. I'm now going to hand back to Inga who will share some top tips on dealing with the final assignment. Thanks guys. I hope there's lots of love hearts for you, Steph. Can you see, are there love hearts for Steph? There's some here. Do you want to come and have a look? Oh, okay. Let's look at the love hearts. There's lots of love hearts. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Katie says bye. bye. Thank you for the love hearts. Thanks, Steph. We're actually getting through everything very quickly this week, so there'll be plenty of time for questions on Twitter. If you can think of some now, perhaps, or some thoughts or reflections uh, that the team can share with me while I get down to the details of the assignments. Okay, so first detail of the assignment is please... Please follow the instructions. Um, I went in today and actually highlighted some of the important parts in red and bolded it because we noticed that some people in particular were posting their assignments to the discussion forum. We were assuming that's what they did. And those people are going to be terribly disappointed when they don't actually get a grade. Um, so if you're one of the people who've, who've posted to the discussion forum, just whip it out and put it in the right place. So if you follow through the steps on the final assignment, you'll get to the link um, very easily. So just keep clicking until you get to the end. Now, um, you won't get a badge if you don't put your assignment in the discussion forum. Okay, so to clarify the assignment, what we want to do is actually take what we've learned here in the MOOC, apply it somewhere in the context. So it's either helping other students, helping your students, um, helping your partner, helping your friend, um, to think of some sort of activity. Now, it can be a workshop, it can be an event, it can be a regular thing like a new shut up and write session that you might start in a cafe. Uh, it can be, I don't know, use your imagination, pair regular Periscope broadcasts. I think they're pretty fun. I wouldn't mind keeping doing them occasionally. Um, but, you know, suggestions for me to do Periscope broadcasts, I'm open to that. I, I just really want to look for how we can actually spread the love and what we've learned and actually make the MOOC matter in the long term. So that's really what we're after. 
Um, people have been questioning, what sort of format do you want it in? Well, Word documents, fine. So just text, a, a text description is fine. Maybe you want to chuck in some pictures. Maybe you can upload it to a Dropbox and share the link. Maybe you can make a video. Maybe you can make an animation. Maybe you can make a diagram with some text. So we're really unfussed about the format, as long as it's legible, readable, um, and straightforward um, that someone else can understand it. So um, some examples, you know, discussion group, workshop, professional development workshop for supervisors, that would be great. Love to see some examples of that. Um, an online group or forum. Uh, you know, keep, keep those suggestions rolling in. We're happy to uh, have a look at, at any questions that you post to the final um, assignment forum. If you want to test out an idea with us, you can send us a link and so on. Uh, we'll get to as many of those as we can. Of course, it's always very busy. Um, so uh, uh, we'll, our moderators will be right in there and we're trying to get to those questions first before we do anything. So at minimum, and you can download the, the cheat sheet that I gave you that shows you what a passing grade should look like. So everyone should probably have a look at that because you have to peer assess. So you have to peer assess three others before your mark will be released. Okay, now that peer assessment process hopefully will also be educational and fun because you'll read the other ideas that people are putting forward and you might think, ah, I can do that as well or maybe I'll add that to what I'm going to do. And you don't have to run the event. You don't have to do it. You can just think it up and never do it. And that's totally fine because someone else might read it and do it. So I think that's, that's where we've got to go with it. So just relax because it's not, it's not a really big deal. It's just meant to be helpful, positive and fun. Okay, so you just need to um, read the guidelines carefully about what you need to provide because also when you're marking or assigning a grade to someone else, you need to keep this rubric, this set of criteria in mind. I'm just going to go through them briefly again. So who is the event or activity for? Now sometimes it can be supervisors and students together, sometimes it might be students, sometimes it's students in biology, students in philosophy. And I'd love to see more of that from the disciplinary perspective. I work always at the sort of multidisciplinary level, but I think we could share so much that would help our really local communities as well. So be very as specific as you want to be with that. You could also maybe think about turning it outwards. What would you do to run for families who want to support PhD students better, that kind of thing. So who is it for? A format or outline of what you'll do. So what's going to happen during the event? You know, how long will it be? It's one way, you know, is it... Weekly? Is it a regular thing? Is it a one-off event? Um, you know, what, what's the format? Are you going to have a small discussion group with tables? Are you going to go for a walk in the forest and talk about stuff? I don't know, whatever it is, but just be specific. One of the benefits, so I often call this the what's in it for me. So, and it's the most powerful emotion in the world, particularly when it comes to attracting people to workshops and events, which is what they hired me for it here at ANU and what I think I'm actually really good at is um, sometimes thinking up great titles and, um, and fun events for people to do that are going to be useful for them. But articulating that benefit is really important. So think, what's in it for me or what's in it for them? Why would they want to come? What's the value add for, for, to spend the time? And that will touch on the rationale and the context of the activity. So how will it help them? Uh, why should they be there? Um, I would like you to reference something in the course, like pick up something that you think is important, that maybe you could take further, that you could trouble a bit. Like we've troubled the idea of boredom, we've troubled the idea of confusion. We've said sometimes it can be a good thing, sometimes it can be a bad thing. We're not being prescriptive in the MOOC and that's been a very deliberate choice. And some people have been confused by that because they thought they're enrolling something that will tell you exactly how to survive your PhD. But of course you get to the end you realise we're just opening up a box and having a look inside. Um, so can you reference some of that material? Maybe look at some of the links that we've included in our reference section. Maybe even read some of the papers. I don't know. You don't have to. But referencing some of the content is um, another criteria you need to look for. And a description of at least two activities. This is so that you can think about um, what during this event or discussion you're going to do. So an activity might be a discussion prompt, so a question that you want people to discuss. It could be a small group discussion, so you have a question and you have the group. What I like to do in my workshops is say, why are you here? Give me your top three reasons. And the group has to talk about their top threes and then they all have to compare and they have to vote. And sometimes I do post-it note activities. So one of my favourites is to describe your writing like it's a car. I know it sounds weird. 
Um, and I got this from Reem Mahmood, who is one of my favourite teachers who works at La Trobe. Hello, Reem, if you happen to be listening. So Reem's idea was if you describe your writing like a car, you actually think about it in a whole different way. So if my writing's like a car, it's like a 1970s red Ferrari. You know, it's really flashy. When I drive it on the street, people are like, ooh, look at the car. But sometimes I get in the garage and it won't start because it has electrical problems. And so this sort of talks about how my writing can be, you know, especially the blog writing is really sort of splashy and, and um, look at me, attention seeking. But I go, do go through periods and I actually had, had that period this week where I just can't write. And I sit down with my keys like this, I'm going to write and it just doesn't happen. Okay, so post a note activity like that's fun. Another one is describe your thesis as an animal. And it's always fun, you get all the participants to put their post-it notes up on the wall and you compare them and talk about them. So activities like that. Look on the web, there's lots of advice on teaching. Um, there's lots of books in the library. If you're already teaching in a toot, you probably um, have used some of these techniques before. So share them maybe on the forum so that other people get ideas of things you've done. Share them on Twitter, that would be fabulous. So if someone's got good ideas on Twitter for activities, just put it on there now with the Survive PhD 15 tag and I'll pick it up and broadcast it. Okay, um, so uh, finally I said, what materials and resources do you need? And this is just a check thing, you know, how achievable is it? It's good to actually start to try and articulate that because it makes you think, well, maybe this is more doable than I thought. Maybe this isn't a crazy idea. Or if you take it to your university and say, hey, I did this MOOC and they suggested this and I came up with this idea and here's, and if someone gave me that, and I'm hoping some of our ANU students will do it and give me their, their um, outline, then someone like me can pick that up and we can really think about what's well, going to cost us um, how long is it going to take? What can I? What room can I put it in? And then it might happen. Okay. Uh, so I hope that clarifies the assignment. Please ask any more questions if you need to. Uh, remember, you need to mark three other peer assignments, and but this shouldn't be too onerous for you. I hope. Please don't just give everyone five. Uh, if someone's really phoning it in and it's kind of, you know, just a, a lame effort, they won't know that you've given them a one. Okay, <laughs> so you can do one. that. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so one's bad, isn't it? And five is good. Am I getting that right? Good. Whew. You never know with edX, I have to say. I get it wrong. Okay, now feedback. If you're giving written feedback, and really we would like you to give just a line or two of written feedback to the person, maybe you're going to suggest a way that they might think about the activity or some aspect of it that's going to help them actually get this thing to work properly. So if you see opportunities or perhaps problems then um, it's useful to point that person out to that person but of course we always want feedback to be constructive and generous because we're in the circle of niceness here in the survive phd mooc okay so i'm sending through a link via crystal about um, how to manage emotions in the feedback process and the emotions of the other person we've talked about this a little bit as the mooc's gone through but some points just worth reiterating you know Focus on one issue at a time. So one sentence focuses on one issue. Um, too many skills and behaviours at once is confusing, it's overwhelming. And um, Don't be too critical or focus too much on the negative. Um, so you're looking to help the person improve, not make them wallow in what they did wrong. Okay, so um, don't avoid the real problems. Um, if there's an issue, just state it um, calmly, you know, uh, uh, without too much emotion and avoid vagueness because vagueness is really hard to action. Use specific examples and connect these to the impact they're going to have. You should do this because blah. Okay, um, of course giving feedback face to face, which is that post that we tweeted out was about, is different from giving feedback in writing as you well know. Um, Katie says here, think about how you will, would like to get feedback when you give it and always good advice. Thanks Katie for that reminder. Um, and we're tweeting through a link for how for giving good feedback and how that's a bit of an art. And I just read a bit of a paragraph from that. Um, and this is a book that um, has been written all about giving written feedback, which is pretty amazing. So writing good feedback requires an understanding that language does more than describe our world. It helps us construct our world. Consider the world view implicit in this comment. What did you think about when you chose that topic? What were you trying to accomplish? 
It implies the student is someone who thinks that the choice the student made had a purpose. It invites the students to discuss the choice and presumably go on to discuss whether the paper can accomplish what it was intended. It positions the student as a chooser and someone who can have a conversation with the teacher. So think about that. Position the person to have a conversation, um, even if it's only one-sided. Uh, right, is there anything from Twitter, guys, that I should be <coughs> talking about? Yes, so Sasan <coughs> yes. um, asked about uh, boredom versus thinking time. Boredom versus thinking time. And uh, the benefits of both, either or. Mm. And we had a question from Katie. Should we seek boredom if we work constantly to fill our time, or is that just personal choice? Hmm. Um, I don't know, seeking boredom, or see, mindfulness and boredom are actually two different things. I think mindfulness is a state of sort of alert, um, yet engaged wakefulness, and boredom is where you're actually zoning out. You're not really maybe even focusing. So mindfulness and meditation are kind of ways of, I think, turning boredom to good purpose. So it's, uh, it's, it's not crowding your mind with stuff, but it's... it's um, uh, but it, it is a focused activity, whereas I think the thing with boredom that makes it really difficult, especially for me, is it's a kind of the distraction that goes with it, the kind of distracted, I'm going to look at Facebook over here, I'm going to look at email, I don't quite know how to settle, and I think that's, that's the essential difference, is the sort of distraction and lack of focus. Yes, mindfulness is the opposite of boredom, I agree, Kelsey. Good. Uh, Tash? Tash? From Oz? Tash from Oz. Hi, ask Tash from Oz. Ask on Periscope. Mm -hmm. What happens if three people don't review your peer review your assignment? What happens if three people don't review your peer assignment, Crystal? Uh, Crystal goes in and peer reviews it for you. Crystal peer reviews it for you, or she says, Inga, you need to go in and do some peer reviewing. No, no one will fail because there wasn't enough people to mark. Did everyone hear that? I hope no one will fail because there wasn't enough people to mark. That's our guarantee here at the How to Survive Your PhD MOOC. Hello, Ollie. That's my nephew saying hello, Auntie Inga. Mm -hmm. Hello, Ollie. <laughs> he's my eight-year-old nephew, everyone, and he's, he's, he's a good critic. That's how he gives it to you straight. He knows how to give feedback. Good one, Ollie. Um, last question. She's staring at her screen like this. She's got good thinking face, our crystal. Uh, I think that's it for questions. That's it. Any other comments? Um, um, is the feedback due on the same day as the assignment itself? I'm pretty sure they're different dates, right? They're different dates, but you can do feedback from so, now, right? Um, the last day you can submit your assignment, I believe, is the 12th of November. Right. Did everyone hear that? Please just tell me. Katie says no. <laughs> um, the last day you can submit your... Your assignment, your assignment is the 12th of November. Which will leave you a week to complete peer feedback. A week to do peer feedback. Ish, which will be the 19th of November. Which is the 19th of November, which is also our party. Our party. So this time we're going to be very specific. This is a face-to-face -face party, okay, that will be happening at Fellows Bar at ANU campus. Any campus, Canberra-based or, I don't know, regional New South Wales, if you want to go for a long drive, you're welcome to come to Fellows Bar. We're putting some money on the bar for some cider, some lemonade and some beer and some snacks. So come along and celebrate with us. We'll send out another email with more details about that, won't we? Yeah. Um, so that's the details. Party. And we'd be really love it if we were doing simultaneous parties somewhere else. I don't know, 9.30 in the morning isn't really a great time for a party, I know. Um, but, you know, you can have coffee and cake, and we might periscope from it. Um, uh, we've had a couple of questions about whether we get to pick who we review or who we, or are they assigned. So, can you pick who you review, and can you? No. No, sorry. Once you've submitted, yes. you are assigned three peers that have already submitted their assignment for you to review. You can ad do additional ones after that. Ah, you can do more, but, but you get you three. You must three. Three minimum, but then you can do more if you want to. So if you're interested in having fun with it, hey, knock yourself out, keep on, keep on peer grading. But, um, but you must do at least three and they'll be assigned. edX is a really mean teacher. You know, nice teachers let you pick. That's true. Yeah, yeah. but it's mean, um, you know. I mean, no, we love edX, but, you know, that's what it gives you. 
Okay, what else do we have? Anything? From Twitter? I suddenly fell through cracks. They did. Scream now, people. Yes. Uh, virtual bring a plate party on Twitter. Love it. Um, refreshments will be provided and survive PhD 15 hashtag and I reckon we're good to go. It's almost as good as being there, except for the smellogram thing that you can't really do online. Um, what else? Julian may change his flights to make the, the party. <gasps> Julian might come to the party. We'd love that, Julian. Come to our party. Anything else? Um... Okay, so next week is the last week. Can you believe it? Um, and next week the theme is love. Yay. Yay. But it's not love as you think it's going to be because that would be boring, wouldn't it? And we don't want to be boring. Well, maybe we do want to be boring. Anyway, hope you've enjoyed the broadcast tonight. We'll be seeing you next week and on the forums. Thanks for joining us. See you soon.